Hello and welcome to ENI UK and Europe edition. I'm Jacola Matera reporting from London. We'll be bringing you news reports from around the United Kingdom and Europe this week. And we have a team of live reporters on standby ready to give their reports. On our program today. A UK study that will in infect volunteers with the COVID-19 has been approved. The Queen's husband, Prince Philip, has been taken to hospital as a precaution. And aeroplanes remain parked as the aviation industry waits for better days. But the first of our live reporters joining us also this week will be Love Ann Caesar. Nice to see you, uh, Love Ann. What will you be reporting for us this week? Thank you, Giancarlo. So, learning lifeline for London kids who are struggling to do online lessons. Thank you, Lavan. We look forward to that later in the show. Also, from the United Kingdom, we are joined live by Rowana Bianca Arino. Thank you for being with us this week. Uh, what story do you have for us today? Hi, Giancarlo. So, for my report, a collection of London memorabilia is going under the hammer in the form of around 270 signs authenticated by the City of Westminster Council. Among the most distinctive is the famous Abbey Road sign. We are also pleased to be joined by one of our reporters from Europe. Mean Glauser is here with us. Um, what updates do you have for us this week, Mean? Uh, hi, Giancarlo. Thank you for having me. So, from Geneva, Switzerland, we'll be reporting about the WHO giving global green light to AstraZeneca Oxford COVID-19 shot. Thank you so much. We also have a report from our bureau in Turkey. It's Melmeri Joy Kivert, who will also give us a, their COVID-19 update from Turkey. From EBC Italy, Jasmine Jamora will report on Italy's new Prime Minister. And we'll end today's show, as always, with our view from our window. This week coming from Geneva's Flower Clock. But first we go back to those main news headlines. A UK study that will infect volunteers with COVID-19 has been approved. A study which will expose volunteers to the coronavirus is to begin in Britain within a month after it gained approval from the country's clinical ethics body, the government said on Wednesday. The study is the first of its kind in the world and will expose up to 90 volunteers between the ages of 18 and 30 to COVID-19 in a controlled environment. The Department for Business, Energy and Industry Strategy said the trial will look to establish the smallest amount of virus needed to cause infection in order to help develop vaccines and treatments. Once the initial phase of the study has concluded, vaccines proven to be safe in clinical trials could be given to small numbers of volunteers who are then exposed to COVID-19 virus. This is helping to identify the most effective vaccines. During the study, medics and scientists will be on hand 24 hours a day to ensure the safety of volunteers as well as monitor the effects of the virus. The study is being backed by £33.6 million of government funding and will work in partnership with London's Royal Free Hospital. Its secure clinical research facilities are specifically designed to contain the virus. Britain is one of the hardest hit countries in the world by the coronavirus, with more than 118,000 deaths. It was also the first Western nation to begin the COVID vaccination campaign, as well as the first to pass the milestone of 15 million people receiving their first jabs this past weekend. Now, Britain's Prince Philip, the husband of Queen Elizabeth II, was recently admitted to a London hospital, with sources saying it was not due to the coronavirus symptoms. The 99-year-old was said to be in good spirits in the private King Edward VII Hospital in Marylebone, where the palace said he was taken on Tuesday evening after feeling unwell. 
The Duke of Edinburgh, as he is formerly known, is expected to remain in hospital for a few days as observations and for observation and rest. A statement from the Buckingham Palace said on Wednesday. The sources told the AFP he was not taken in by ambulance and felt well enough to walk into the hospital himself. Prime Minister Boris Johnson's office has said and sent best wishes to the Duke of Edinburgh as he undergoes a few days of rest in hospital. Planes parked as the aviation industry waits for better days. Travel restrictions and closed borders and mandatory quarantines on top of travelers' financial difficulties and also health concerns have had a major impact on the aviation industry. In 2020, air traffic was down two-thirds. And according to the International Air Transport Association, a return to 2019 levels cannot be expected before 2024. Parking planes that are currently not in regular service has quickly become a problem for airline companies. A recent study by the Oliver Wayman Consultancy shows that 3,400 planes have been taken out of regular service in 2020, and 2,400 of those were retired ahead of schedule. In eastern France, a new parking site was created due to the high demand for storage. Despite adding a new location, the firm's owner is already saying that they are quickly running out of space and that the waiting list remains long. Aircrafts that are in storage also require maintenance operations such as protecting sensitive areas and testing electronics. Compare this to the 150 planes in 2019 they are now taking in over 230 planes at four airports. In France, the pandemic is also causing job loss and reducing training opportunities. Airbus plans to go to let go of 5,000 employees, while Air France plans to cut 8,500 jobs. The Apprenticeship Training Center for Air Professionals has also put its courses for flight attendants and stewards on hold. The number of apprentices in the 2020 academic year are down by half to just 300 students. Please come back for some more ENI UK and Europe edition. Boses ang mangingibabaw upang kunin ang huling pwesto sa buwan ng Pebrero. Let's find out sa dito sa tumitin ding a boses ay sa biggest talent competition on Philippine TV and online. This is Tagisa ng Galing Part 2 Singing Edition. Tuloy-tuloy ang saya sa 2021 dahil hatid ng Net25 para sa inyo ang pinakabagong game show na talaga namang mapapakanta ka sa sarap. It's singing time na! Monday to Friday at 8pm. Dito lang yan sa Net25. Welcome back to ENI UK and your petition. Now for some more interesting stories from around the United Kingdom this week. With school classes taking place online, schooling has been difficult for some children. Joining us from London with more details is Love Ann Season. Hello, Love Ann. Hi, Giancarlo. So many children in London have struggled to continue their schooling during the pandemic due to a lack of computers or tablets. Now, since the lockdown introduced in January, the Cat Bites group in Lewisham in southeast London has seen demand from local schools constantly outstrip of supply. Schools in England closed in early January as the new variant of coronavirus cases has caused to surge. A date of reopening has not yet been set, but the government said it will announce a roadmap for easing restrictions next week. Now, school closures have revealed the large number of families 
cannot afford the laptops or tablets needed for remote learning. Damian Griffiths, Cat Bites, shares his concern. Let's listen in. The main one is the schools, because we didn't really do anything with young people, because they know how to use technology, but I was surprised how many don't have any laptops at home, because it, it seems like there's a new generation that rely on mobile phones, and they have internet at home, uh, but they don't have a laptop, so they don't have something appropriate for doing uh, schoolwork or homework. And now with the online learning, the online schooling, every child needs a laptop, so it's really a demand that's way in excess of I mean, the demand to us from Lewisham is, is a way in excess of what we can deliver. So Lewisham is nothing exceptional. The number of children in poverty there is slightly below the average of the capital. Catbites usually runs workshops for adults, but during the pandemic, it has switched to helping children and has a lot more volunteers, Griffiths has said. Volunteers sort through the laptops, prioritizing ones that can be easily fixed while others are put on one side, and they can fix them during their little downtimes. John Carlin? Thank you, Lavan. Uh, so with the schools now in London being closed for over a month, what kind of support are there for the schools and the students to help those online schooling, especially those who do not have the appropriate laptop or gadget? So while well, Giancarlo Ofcom estimates that uh, between 1.1 to 1.8 million or 9% of children do not have access to laptops, computers, or even tablets at home. So the Department of Education has delivered more than a, a million laptops and tablets to the most disadvantaged children in the country as part of this 400 million investment to support the schools. And they are also receiving uh, some schools, um, wireless routers, but uh, they say that they are not receiving enough. Now, Giancarlo, uh, another issue is the data because you may have a laptop, but the data is an ongoing cost, as we know. So there are data providers, however, including Vodafone, uh, BT Mobile, and uh, O2, that are offering free mobile increases. And schools and local authorities in England can ask this on behalf of the children who do not have the fixed broad broadband at home, or they cannot afford uh, a mobile data, and also are getting disruptions to their learning at home. Giancarlo. Thank you, Lavan, for bringing us that interesting story this week, and thank you for joining us again. Thank you, Giancarlo, reporting for Eagle News. I'm Love and Season from London, United Kingdom, and we'll live in interesting times. Okay, staying in the United Kingdom now, uh, the famous Abbey Road sign is going under the hammer. Rowena has the update. Hello, Rowena. Anglophiles, collectors, and Beatles fans began a bidding battle as a bevy of original London street signs, including one of the iconic Abbey Road, went on sale at auction. The world-famous street home to the studios where the Beatles recorded most of their albums is the standout lot in the collection of around 270 used signs being offered at the two-week online sale. Abbey Road itself featured on the cover of the Fab Four album of the same name and the sign could fetch more than £5,000 or equivalent to US dollars or €5,750 according to auctioneer Catherine Sutton who is handling the offering. The interest so far has just been astronomical. I mean, we, we didn't think that people would be so interested in them because in total, as I say, there's about 270 signs, but what makes these so special is these have all been taken from London streets. They haven't been reproduced because there's so many people try to reproduce these signs, but actually you cannot reproduce them. Because, but perhaps the one that most people will know and that has created a massive amount of interest is Abbey Road. Everybody wants Abbey Road. And we're so lucky to have one of those signs which we've put into our auction at a couple of thousand pounds. But so many have people have been interested. Don't know what's going to happen. Bidding the unique piece of signage reached £1,110 within hours of the auction getting underway. Other notable names going under the virtual hammer include Princess Gate, which overlooks Hyde Park in the upmarket Knightsbridge district, and Savoy Place near the River Thames in the West End. Pimlico Road 
in the SW1 postcode, a key destination for antique stealers and interior designers, Westbourne Park Road on the Notting Hill Carnival Route, and Belgrave Place in Swaku, Belgravia are also expected to prove popular. Westminster City Council, responsible for the local governance in most of central London, is selling the collection, pledging to invest the money raised, as they said, back into services for people in our city. The sign's iconic design, which features the street name in black and the corresponding postcode in red, was created by architect and designer Misha Black in 1967 for the council. It cannot be used anywhere else in the world under copyright law. Thank you, Rowena. Uh, what makes these uh, London street signs so unique? And what is the main reason why people are wanting to buy them? Well, Giancarlo, it is said to be iconic as the wonderful black and red colors of the signs is often associated with London. There are original signs which have been on the London streets in recent years. It will also be an opportunity to own part of the city's history. People have been buying into this whole idea of buying a street sign and putting it up in their home for a bit of nostalgia. This was according to the auctioneer. She also said that at times like this, when a lot of people are staying outside of London and not commuting in, people can forget the sights, the sounds, the smells of the city. And for the buyers, these signs are wonderful to have to remind us of the famous streets of London. Thank you so much for bringing us that story today, Rowena. Thank you, Giancarlo, reporting for Eagle News. I'm Rowana Bianca Arino, and we live in interesting times. Okay, it's time for another break now, but please come back and join us for some more ENI UK and your petition. It is time to listen to the youth in a project developed by the Worldwide Fund for Nature Philippines called QC 2030. We will be talking about sustainability that impacts on society, environment, and economy. Malaki ang parte na magiging uh, maipiplay ng mga small business owners or entrepreneurs para mas uh, ma-develop yung mga ideas na naumpisahan na ng mga kabataan. Ito pong ginagawa po namin, hindi lang po ito para sa kinabukasan namin, kundi para sa fellow youth po namin at ng mga susunod po pong generation. Ms. Amy Belian, Project Manager, Worldwide Fund for Nature Philippines, and Ms. Ila Adige, our City 2030 Student Facilitator, will be joining us in this week's episode of Open for Business. Welcome back to ENI UK and Europe edition. Now we have some more interesting stories from around Europe this week. We firstly go to Geneva, Switzerland, where the World Health Organization has recently announced the global approval of the AstraZeneca Oxford COVID-19 vaccine. With us today with more of the topic is Mian Glauser. Hello, Mian. Hi, John Carlo. So yes, last Monday, the World Health Organization, or WHO, headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, gave its approval for an emergency global use of the AstraZeneca Oxford's COVID-19 vaccine. The COVAX, the global program aiming to provide access to vaccines equitably all over the world, regardless of wealth, the distribution would start from poorer countries lacking doses to fight the pandemic. After the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine, AstraZeneca Oxford is only the second COVID-19 jab that has been authorized by the WHO. It is said by the UN Health Agency that the WHO approved two versions of these vaccines. Both of them are produced by the Serum Institute of India or SII and by the SK Bio in South Korea. Quality, safety, and efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines are required for the emergency use of it in the WHO co-led COVAX facility. Its first wave of distribution counts 337.2 million doses, from which 145 participating economies will be able to immunize 3.3% of their collective population by mid-2021. 
It includes 240 million SII AstraZeneca Oxford doses, 96 million South Korean AstraZeneca Oxford doses, and 1.2 million Pfizer doses. At first, because of the lack of data on the efficacy of AstraZeneca Oxford's vaccine on people aged over 65, countries avoided using them on this most vulnerable age group. However, after witnessing its performance with younger adults, the experts concluded that the vaccine would work and be safe as well for older people. Back to you, Giancarlo. Thank you, Min. Um, could we also ask you, um, how is the, with this um, vaccinations going worldwide, how is the world doing right now with the actual number of coronavirus cases? Yes, so as of now, the number of COVID-19 cases globally has dropped for a fifth consecutive week. Compared to the week of January 4, with 5 million cases, in the week starting February 8, we count 2.6 million cases, an approximate drop of half of its initial number. Back to you, Giancarlo. Thank you so much for bringing us that update this week. Thank you also um, for having me, Giancarlo. I'm Ann Gozer reporting from the Geneva, Switzerland Bureau, and we live in interesting times. Okay, we go to Turkey now, where Turkey continues to live under a curfew due to this pandemic. So bringing us an update this week is Mel Marie Joy Kovetz. Uh, let's watch her report. Hello again. Amid the pandemic that hit the world last year, 2020, people are still struggling to live here in Turkey. The government of Turkey has implemented a curfew on weekdays and weekends. On weekdays, the curfew is from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m., which means people are only allowed to go out from 5 a.m. to 9 p.m. All senior citizens are allowed to go out from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. during weekdays. People aged 21 and younger are allowed to go out from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. also on weekdays. Every weekend is a total lockdown for all ages. All schools are closed. Only online classes are being observed except for kindergarten, which opened last year, December 21. For restaurants, cafes, and fast food chains, only takeout and food delivery are allowed. Still no dining in allowed. The country reported additional 666 symptomatic patients last February 14. The health ministry reported the total cases to be at 2.58 million. Total death toll has reached 27,471. The total number of recoveries is over 2.74 million. At present, more than 31.51 million COVID tests have been implemented. Since December 2019, the pandemic took 2.39 million lives in 192 countries. Thank you for having me today. I am Mel Marijoy Kovet, reporting from Istanbul, Turkey. We live in interesting times. Thank you, Mel Marie and EBC Turkey for that report and update. Uh, we go to Italy now, where they have named a new prime minister. And to bring us this report is Jasmine Jamora. Let's watch her report. Andrea Draghi formally sworn in as the new Prime Minister in Italy last February 13, 2021, at the Quirinal Palace in Rome, bringing in a new era in Italian politics, following weeks of instability in the Eurozone's their largest economy. Giuro di essere fedele alla Repubblica. Draghi, age 73, is known as Super Mario for doing whatever it takes to save the Eurozone. He was one of Italy's foremost experts in public finances before heading the all-important economy ministry. He has the support of 62% of Italians based on a new survey. The pandemic has left more than 93,000 people dead in Italy and triggered the country's deepest recession since World War II. Italy is the Eurozone's third largest economy, but it has been ravaged by the pandemic, registering the worst fall in GDP in the euro area with an 8.9% contraction in 2020. 
That is why the economy will be the main focus for the new government. Reporting from ABC Milan, Italy, I am Jasmine Jamora and we live in interesting times. Thank you so much, Jasmine, for bringing us that report from Italy. And we end this week's show, as always, with our view from our window. So let's take a look at Geneva's flower clock this week. It's located by the lake. The flower clock contains 12,000 flowers and plants. It combines Geneva's know-how in watchmaking and horticulture. It's cre it was created in 1955, and the clock reflects Swiss precision, and its time is transmitted through satellite. It also holds the world's longest second hand at 2.5 meters long. The clock's colors, plants, and arrangement change every season, so please make sure you don't miss it when you visit Geneva, Switzerland. This view is courtesy of Christine Benedicto from our EBC Switzerland Bureau. Thank you so much, Christine, for this view. That's it for today's program. We hope you stay safe and keep positive as we bring you more stories next week from around the United Kingdom and Europe. I'm Giancarlo Matera, and we live in interesting times.